hello hello everyone i just got some post hello everyone welcome to my august reading wrap up i know it's a little bit late but you know better late than never truth is it's probably just taken me so long to edit this down <laughs> i read 11 books in august and it is going to be quite a long video to review them all i think if you're new, welcome. My name's Charlotte. I have a 100 book reading goal for 2023. And I think, let me check, we are officially 50 books deep, so we are halfway through my reading target, which I don't think is so bad. You'll notice my filming background is slightly different today because I'm filming downstairs because it was too hot to film in my bedroom. I think I should just get into reviewing because I've read 11 books this month and that's my highest total for the month so far, the whole year, if that makes sense. I read eight digital books and three physical books. I am gonna link my story graph in the description below. Um, that will have all my information on my reading stats, what I'm currently reading. You can add me as a friend on there if you like. Um, you can see my TBR, what's upcoming, etc., etc. Get a drink, get a snack, get comfy. Let's get reviewing. My first read of the month was on Kindle and it's called Credence by Penelope Douglas. This is a NSFW, like very spicy, I suppose dark romance, kind of like contemporary fictional romance. It's a wide shoes style romance. This book got two stars for me. I rated it 2.5 on Storygraph, but I'm actually gonna drop it down to two. Tiernan's famous parents, Tiernan's are female MC, they die suddenly, leaving her feeling a kind of way. She doesn't feel as sad as she should. She's shipped off to some small town in Colorado to live with Jake, who is her father's estranged stepbrother. So they're not biologically related and his two sons Noah and Caleb and they teach her the ways of the country. Like I said this is a wide trees romance so you can probably guess what happens. I've come to discover that Miss Penelope Douglas her writing style is just not for me. I know the draw of her books is she often toes the line with taboo topics especially so I've read Birthday Girl and I didn't really enjoy that one either. This was marginally better than Birthday Girl and don't get me wrong, the towing the line of the taboo topics is not what I take issue with because I'm not gonna judge anyone, I'm not gonna shame anyone for liking that book. I've read a lot of taboo topic books and enjoyed them. Some of the things I didn't like about this book, um, and this might can like allude to some brief spoilers, so just be wary of that. Tiernan is frequently referenced as being underage when the book starts, and I know that that plays quite a lot into the story, but I just feel like there is so much mention of it because she does turn 18 over the duration of the book but them just constantly referring to her as underage i oh, i know that that's like a taboo in itself it didn't sit right for me personally there's a moment at the start where she basically gets assaulted but enjoys it and it's it's not framed as like a consensual non-consent it's just framed as like an assault and she's actually like really upset it was quite triggering to read and then she's like hey actually i don't know i don't know i'm not judging anyone that's into that it i didn't like the style of writing for that scene like i said it's not the taboo writing material that i take issue with i think it's just the writing style overall and having read birthday girl i think i've just deduced that Penel penelope douglas's writing style maybe just isn't for me how book just has like no step bro like what are you doing vibes and i just think caleb's an arsehole i'm gonna review out of chronological order now because the next book i read was flawless by elsie silver but this month i actually read the whole of the chestnut spring series so i'm gonna review all the individual books back to back even though i read different books between them and then i'm gonna review the series as a whole and then we'll get back onto the other books. This section is going to contain spoilers because obviously it's like the chestnut springs universe so if you haven't read them please just skip forward out of this section. All of these books were read on Kindle Unlimited as well. So my second book of the month was Flawless by Elsie Silver. These are a small town romance spicy book series. Cowboy Ranch Western theme is very popular at the moment. And this book for me gets 3.5 stars. Our male main character, Rhett Eaton, he is a champion bull rider. He's like the best at what he does. He has gotten into an altercation that's been in the press and he's been assigned essentially a babysitter to clean up his image by his agent. The babysitter is his agent's daughter who works for the firm, Summer. I'll review all these individually like just really quickly and then review it all as a series. I'll maybe talk about like what was my favourite book from the series as well because I'm kind of unsure. So I liked Summer but I don't know, I wasn't that invested in her and Rhett's romance or 
chemistry. I don't know if it was him maybe because I wasn't like that attracted to him as far as male main characters go. Like I was invested enough to keep reading and clearly read the whole series but I wasn't that invested in them as a couple. I felt like I was more invested in her. I was surprised at the extra depth in Summer's storyline and plot line because I was kind of just expecting this to be just like a cheap shitty like romance series. I, I read a romance series like years and years and years ago that was really really bad but really really good called Six Pack Ranch. I know, I know and I was expecting it to kind of be like similar to this. I could already tell that it was going to be a very well rounded out series and the characters did feel like, even though I wasn't that invested in Rhett, the characters did feel very fleshed out so I was enjoying reading it straight off the bat. This definitely wasn't my favourite book of the series but I hear that that's quite a popular opinion, like people don't really love the first book but carry on reading. Chestnut Springs book two is called Heartless and this is four stars for me. So Willa is hired as Cade's nanny for two months over the summer to look after his son Luke, I think this son's called Luke. She has no nannying qualifications and he is literally like the meanest, grumpiest, arsiest single dad you've ever met. Book one wasn't what I'd actually class like enemies to lovers. It was kind of like, we don't like each other. It was like rivals. It was forced proximity. Book two is Grumpy Sunshine. I think I have to admit that I like Grumpy Sunshine a lot more than I realised. So what age gap is not my vibe and neither usually would kind of like nanny single dad be my vibe i really really liked this book this kind of like warmed the frosty cockles of my heart like it was really sweet willa is such a fun character i feel like this is such a romantic but still quite sexy book like she is such a good fun character and her relationship with luke Cade's son is so heartwarming it's really really sweet it's really pure it's nice to have uh, a focus on a relationship that's not just the main romantic relationship in the book. Her relationship with Luke and Cade, the way it was like carved out and explored, it feels like Endgame from the very start of the book. Like it feels like a sure deal, a done thing. And it's really kind of like stable and comfy and warm. I don't know, this kind of like family style dynamic isn't usually what I like in like a smutty romance but it just added a bit of depth to it that was really enjoyable. Book three of Chestnut Springs was called Powerless and this one is 3.5 stars for me. This one is kind of like childhood best friends, like long-term friends, both with broken hearts. So Sloane leaves Sterling at the altar, she can't do it and Jasper is there to help her pick up the pieces. Sloane is a pro ballerina and Jasper is like Canada's most famous ice hockey player. Firstly, friends to lovers, yes please. Friends to lovers is a hard one to write and I think Elsie Silva did pretty good on this one. I think the sex scenes are written really well in this book and were probably a bit more interesting to read. And I really liked the weird complexity of Jasper and Sloane's relationship. They had that weird complexity that you would have if you'd been friends with someone like your whole, whole life and fancied them your whole life, you know, when there's a lot of layers to their feelings. Even though it did take like 18 years for Jasper to realise he fancied Sloane, which to be honest, that would really annoy me. Like 18 years to admit it. I found the pacing a bit hard to keep up with in the book so the moving around and the travelling and the scene changing. From my understanding they were on a road trip after Sloane left the altar but it was supposed to be over the course of two weeks, it felt a lot longer than two weeks, I don't know, it just it, that bit kind of lost me. I don't think that was really clear but that literally just could have been me not comprehending properly. Book four in the Chestnut Spring series is called Reckless and I think it was my favourite. It's really hard to say. It's gonna get, oh, it's either a four or a 4.5. I'm gonna tell you why now. So Winter is finally free of her evil, evil marriage to Rob, I think his name is, and she meets Theo De Silva and they spend one incredibly sexy night together and it's supposed to be a secret. Okay, the reason I love this book so much is I love redemption. I love growth in a character. This is giving me, if you've read Akatar, Winter is giving Nesta. We're supposed to hate her. We spend nearly the entire whole book series hating her, not getting her, because we see her lovely warm sister's POV. I have so much sympathy for Winter. I know that's the point, but you know, when you kind of almost begrudged to read 
the cold sister's book because you're like, yeah, well, I think you're kind of a dick. And then you read it and you're like, oh, you're just a product of your circumstance. Like you always are. And then you warm up. We're supposed to hate winter. Like we were supposed to hate Nesta and I just can't do it. None of us can. I really liked their story of how they met. It like gets you kicking your feet and giggling. I will say I did have a little bit of like a stop start with this relationship in this book because I was reading it and I was like, oh, what? This is gonna contain spoilers. I was reading it and I was like, oh, okay, like a fade to black in like the first couple of hours, like the first couple of hundred pages. And then I was like, oh, okay. And then I was like, wait, what? You'll see why in a minute. Unplanned pregnancy trope is not my jam. Like I, I don't love it. I don't hate it. I can live without it in my books. I see why she did it for winter. But the one thing that falls apart completely for me is I don't believe for a second that Theo de Silva wouldn't have known somewhere, somehow, that Winter had a baby. Which is probably why this book isn't higher rated for me. So I don't understand how when you're as close in it of a community and a family, like how does Theo know all the stuff that went down with Summer and Winter for the last four books, but Rhett just failed to mention, this is like humongous tea as well, like such big family goss, failed to mention that his sister-in-law is pregnant and is refusing to tell anyone who the baby daddy is. Like he knows the historical gossip about summer and winter because Rhett's running his mouth at the rodeo, at the bullfighting ring. So why would Rhett, after eight months, so eight months after she's had the baby and the nine months before, not mention, oh, you know, like, yeah, Summer's really stressed or Summer's been spending a lot of time with Winter because she's pregnant. The math isn't mathing and it's such a small little bone for me to pick, but that's what I was thinking the whole time through. I fell in love with them both. I fell in love with their whole family set up. I fell in love, I was invested. I was betrayed, I was invested. I loved it all. I went through everything that Winter went through with her, but that one thing just was a bit of a sticking point for me. I just didn't get it. To review the whole series, the whole series is definitely four out of five stars for me. The the fifth star will hinge on Bo's book, which is yet to be released, I think. And I'm gonna say that my favorite book was the last one, Reckless. It's hard to say whether that's because I read that the most recently, but I did enjoy that book the most, I think. I was the most hooked on it. Overall, I think the series is so well written. Like each character feels very complete. I can envision the world building, Chestnut Springs. I can see everything perfectly. All the characters feel written pretty equally in terms of depth, except for maybe Rhett, but that was a first book and you do see him throughout the other books. So yeah, it was just a really enjoyable read. I think I've got biscuit in my teeth because I just had to have a little snack between filming. I've lost count on what book number we're on, but the next book was also a Kindle Unlimited book. I do get to physical books at some point, I promise. And this one was called Blood Orange and it was by Karina Howe. This is the Dracula duet number one, book number one. I read them back to back, so they're gonna be reviewed at the same time, don't worry. This book gets a 3.75 for me. I know that's a really fussy review. It's supposed to be a modern day Dracula retelling. Basically, a guy back in the whatever century watches the love of his life get murdered and then he discovers he's a vampire. Over the centuries, he keeps finding his love as she gets reincarnated and then losing her again and finding her and losing her again and finding her. This time round, she comes back as his music student. It's set in Venice. He doesn't recognize her this time round because she's come back as a witch and she is trying to kill him, but she doesn't know him in that way either. So she knows who he is, but she's trying to kill him. First thing off the bat, this is a very smutty book. Like, seriously, like it almost, I'm not saying it almost is too smutty, but it almost is. The first like three chapters was a bit like, what happened to hello, hi, how are you? That almost put me off because I found that when a book leads with some really heavy explicit scenes that kind of make me cringe a bit, it's that the plot isn't very good. But this one wasn't that bad. Once I moved past that like first couple of chapters, I got it a bit more, but that first scene I was a bit like, okay. So I don't read vampire books that often. Um, the last ones I did read, I really enjoyed. I really, really loved the setting of this book. I liked that it was set in modern day Venice. That setting for a vampire is just like so gothic, so 
like I can just see it the the heavy masquerade the water the canals like gothic architecture oh it just it really worked well and that's one thing I really hugely enjoyed about it interesting concept of reincarnation I liked that spicy gory bloody the middle was a bit lacking for me and then the end got really good blood orange is definitely supposed to be more of like a kinky read um so if you are here for plot with romance thrown in you're gonna get more sex with plot thrown in on to book two of the dracula duet so i read uh, black rose by christina howe to synopsize book two is basically is it her destiny to love him or is it her destiny to die this book got three stars from me maybe i'm changing my ways but i think there was a little bit too much sex in this book i wanted this to be really good because i was really invested in book one and the romance of it but i just didn't love it it felt like there was no point to this book other than to finish what happened in book one that sounds really harsh but i was just reading it and it just felt a bit nothingy Val 2, that's the main Dracula, Val 2's character development was was starting off good because he's obviously just turned into this like shell of a person, well shell of a vampire, and he needs to like find his way back to his humanity. I just, I mean this could even get a 2.5, I just found him a bit boring. I stuck around because I felt like I needed closure for this book, but yeah I'm probably being generous with a 3, so let's change it to a 2.5. Black Rose had a lot more horror elements than the first book so just be prepared for that there was a lot more um kind of like gothic and also troubling imagery in this book than there was in the first one very very nightmarish energy the writing was quite bad too the next book I read was a physical book and it was The Pisces by Melissa Broder this is a contemporary fiction book and it gets uh 4.5 stars from me our main character Lucy has been writing her dissertation on Sappho for like over a decade when her and her boyfriend break up and she moves to LA for the summer and house sits for her sister. This is a very very deranged book. The main character is attending like groups for people with love addictions, she's caring for a diabetic dog, she's making unhinged friends, she's drinking a lot. It's very neurotic and very real she's basically trying to find herself. This has very, very mixed reviews. I personally, how many times do I have to say I personally, but I personally love an unlikable character. Like I think the main character is so, so unlikable, but I think that's what makes it so good. I think it got a lot of bad reviews because it's really dark at some points and it's really cruel. Obviously, please look up all your trigger warnings for these books, but there is some like animal cruelty in it. And I think a lot of people are rating it down for that, which is super, super valid. If you can't read that, you can't read that. If you can't handle that, you can't handle that. But I, I'm not saying I like the animal cruelty, but I'm liking how unashamed and unabashed and how unhinged the main character is like it's not it's not about the animal cruelty it's about her problems and making her just be like problematic in every area of her life i felt a bit prude reading this it's very sexually explicit it's very present the flaws of the main character are a big focus i think this is one of those books that you'll just remember for a while for being just completely and utterly strange next book i read i don't even know what count we're on now but it's another kindle unlimited read and it's called the cloisters and it's by katie hayes this is a mysterious fiction, dark academia-ish, thrillery kind of vibe. Gets a 3.5 stars for me. I got this as a recommendation because I wanted a dark, cosy, academic, like autumnal read. Um, and I really like The Secret History. So I know I, I'm gonna try not to do too much comparison between this and The Secret History, but if you do like The Secret History and you need like a bit of a void filler, this will be a good book for you. So I'm seeing on Storygraph, this is described as The Secret History meeting the ninth house. So Anne moves to New York, expecting to be working in the MoMA, but she's assigned to the Met Cloisters, which is like a gothic castle museum that specializes in medieval art and artifacts. She becomes like part of a small research team there and just becomes like embroiled in the cloisters essentially. Visually the cloisters absolutely fucking smacked like hot summer in New York, cool medieval gothic museum, lots of divination, tarot, like the whole book is basically based on tarot cards and like ancient methods of divination. It was just it was like a sensory delight to read. 
I think my problem is that I should have just reread The Secret History. So The Secret History is a five star read for me and I've already, it was the first book I read this year and I wanted something that evoked like the same absorbing, engaging reading feeling for me. And I think I was comparing that book too much with this book which feels unfair. The thing that was missing from this book was that the main character felt too naive and I know that sounds really silly but she was almost a bit too passive. She wasn't like culpable enough. It definitely had the same like twisty turny plot intrigue, layers of relationships between all of the characters that was very odd and left you like chase reading like wanting to get to the next bit very intriguing felt like it could have been longer don't know if i would have enjoyed it if it was longer it was just very much an okay read for me like i said if you've read the secret history it might fill that gap for you but if you haven't read the secret history i would just recommend reading the secret history first we're working through the physical tbr because my next read was stone blind by natalie haynes I love a Greek retelling. I'm trying to read more. This is essentially a retelling of Medusa's story. And this for me gets four stars, just under four stars. I've changed my mind and I'm gonna say 3.75. Only because while this was good and I enjoyed all the different POVs, I feel like we were getting too much Perseus. Ironically enough, we heard much too much about the men that played their part in Medusa's fate. I would say the second half of the book felt way too much about Perseus. I have only read two Greek retellings so far, even though I'm really enjoying the genre. So it's an unfair comparison, but this one just felt a little bit weaker. Maybe I just had high hopes for Stone Blind. I enjoyed the POVs and the different perspective shifts. At times I felt there could have been less, slightly less. Overall, it was quite an engaging read. And obviously you do have a lot of sympathy for Medusa and Natalie Haynes is really good at telling Medusa's story. I just think it lost its wind a little bit into the second half. This is going to sound like a really weird comment and I'm not very good at reviewing so I don't know how to vocalise this in a way that makes sense. But in the other Greek retelling I read, and it does feel unfair to draw comparison, but this is one thing I noticed, is that I read the book and the book happened to me. The, the retelling of the mythology washed over me. I felt like I was watching it. I felt very immersed in the story. Whereas this, I felt like an active reader reading what was going on and it made it just a bit challenging. Maybe it was because you are addressed as the reader at some points, but I don't really like that in a book necessarily. I like to be fully immersed. I hope that makes sense and I hope that doesn't sound childish or juvenile. I'm not a very good reviewer. I'm just kind of like reviewing as a hobby, so. So my final book of the month, I feel like I've forgotten one and I definitely haven't, but it was The Daughter of Smoke and Bone by Lainey Taylor. This is book one in the series. The cover is so, so beautiful and it's a young adult fantasy. This gets four stars from me. This is actually a reread. I read this when I was maybe like 16, I wanna say. Um, basically, I could remember this book really, really well in my head. I borrowed it from a library at school and I remember it because the protagonist had natural blue hair and she had some kind of like fantastical otherworldly portal and i remember it because she lived in prague and not a lot of fantasy books are set in prague and i couldn't remember what it was and i searched and searched and searched and searched and eventually i found it thanks to the what is this book subreddit and funnily enough i've been seeing a lot of people rereading this on tiktok recently so i thought why not let's order it and have a little reread for good time's sake so our main character karu is a 17 year old art student in prague and she has two completely separate lives her human life and her non-human life and she's managed to keep the two in balance pretty well the portals to her other life and her other world are starting to close but everyone's kept a lot of secrets from her so she's basically having to do the digging on who she is what's going on where everyone's gone i really liked it because it's young adult it's not a very taxing read but it doesn't feel juvenile at the same time it has maybe because it's the time of year and how old i was when i read it but it had that kind of like twilight-ish element of fantasy and i don't mean in a bad way it just was very comforting it plods along it's very very whimsical and something about it being set in snowy prague gothic architecture chimera and angels being like the main kind of fantasy element of it 
it is just very lovely like it's a very whimsical fantastical read so there are some flashbacks in it and i'm not usually a flashback kind of fan actually flashbacks really annoy me in books but i didn't find that difficult to read at all i probably will go on to read the second book in the series because i never actually did that when i was younger this came out and the second book wasn't out yet because i read it in hardback and i never went for the second book it was a very atmospheric read i would probably bump this up to four and a half stars actually that was my august reading wrap up i hope this video isn't super super long and i hope it, if it is it's not very very boring for you and i'm really hoping i haven't forgotten any of the books as always thank you for all your recommendations be sure to add me on storygraph because i love seeing what everyone else is reading too and i am starting to post regularly on instagram on my stories what i'm reading i have got a books highlight that you can go take a look at right my babes i will see you next month for another reading wrap up but i will see you on sunday for another video and yeah thank you so much have a lovely rest of your week and i will see you soon bye